Most of them. How many of you are concerned about the impact stress has on your health, your well-being, your productivity, your ability to focus? Yeah, most of you. How many of you are concerned about the impact <coughs> of modern life on your stress levels? Okay. How many of you have got a mobile phone? Okay, I assume all of you. <laughs> yeah. It's a good point, we'll get to that in a minute, but if you wouldn't mind, put it to silent or turn it off for now so you can enjoy your day. How many of you can check your emails on your mobile phone? How many of you can check Facebook on your mobile phone? How many of you have checked Facebook since arriving here today? Wow. <laughs> this is what we're here to talk about. <laughs> How many of you are not concerned about stress at all in any way? Okay, good. Well, if, if, if you're not that concerned about stress, thank you for being here anyway. I'm sure there'll be something here that will I find you for you. Stress is one of the biggest issues facing modern society. It can cause everything from heart disease, to depression, to musculoskeletal issues, to all kinds of things. In fact, according to the NHS, 23,000 people are going to have a heart attack next month. Many of them could have been caused by stress. Are you or someone you know going to be one of them? Hopefully not. And hopefully there'll be some things that we can cover today which will ensure that you, that you don't end up as one of those statistics. So I'm Neil Shah. I run an organisation called the Stress Management Society. We're a national not-for-profit organisation set up to provide advice, support and guidance to people and companies that firstly want to recognise stress and want to know what to do about it when it happens. Because half the battle is actually recognising it. It's very difficult to do something if you don't know that you're in a particular state in the first place. It's very difficult to find an answer when you don't fully understand the question. And really that's... Yeah, we can have the door closed. I think we're just expecting a couple more people, that's the reason. But yeah, that's fine. Thank you. And that's really what we're here to do today, is firstly to understand the challenge, how it appears and manifests in our, in our lives, and then what we can do about it. Now, we're going to be spending the whole day together, so just want to give you an idea of what to expect. You do have a program in your pack, but we're going to be starting by covering your personal triggers the truth about relaxation. What happens to us when we get stressed? What the signs or symptoms of stress are? What stress actually means? I'm gonna be introducing some techniques, we call them our five gorilla techniques to combat stress whenever you experience it. And really the morning is focused on helping you to get a handle on your stress. And in the afternoon, we're gonna be teaching you how to achieve success. So the, the program essentially is reduce stress so you can achieve success. The two go hand in hand. You take yourself out of a state of survival, you can then begin, in, you begin thinking about how you can achieve your goals. So that's what this afternoon's about. So we're going to be teaching you um, some simple self-hypnosis uh, activities. And we're going to be um, going through the four self fail-safe ways to get 100% out of your day. And the last session of the day, we'll be teaching you some goal-setting techniques. We call it our platinum goal-setting techniques. So you can essentially skyrocket your success. So we'll literally be spending the day, firstly, helping you to get a handle on your stress and the challenges that prevent you from achieving your potential. And in the afternoon, showing you how you can set the goals to actually go about fulfilling your potential. So you're actually gonna walk away today with your goals mapped, how you can go about beginning to achieve them, and also being able to recognize very clearly the triggers for stress in your life. Now, this is your day. You've invested the most valuable resource that you have available, which is your time. You know, money comes and goes, but the one thing you cannot replace is your time. So firstly, let me thank you for giving up your Saturdays and investing that time in yourself. And I'm firmly committed to ensuring you get maximum value from the time that you invested here today, but I need your help for that. So there are a couple of ground rules. Firstly, this day is for you. So you will get out of it what you put into it. So I encourage you to play full out, ask questions, challenge, be open-minded, 
you know, be open to new ideas and new things. If you don't like what I'm suggesting here, you never need to discuss those things again. You never need to try those exercises again, but give it a go. So are we all open to approach you today with scientific rigor? Good, which means try it out. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you never need to do it again. And also, are you open to having fun? Yes. Good. As far as I'm concerned, education should be entertaining. There are far too many workshops and management training programs that I've been to where some bloke will go through a PowerPoint presentation and five minutes into it, I'm falling asleep and I actually take very little away from it. You may have noticed there's no computer. There is no PowerPoint presentation today. So those of you that did come here, you know, looking for a warm corner to have a snooze, sadly, this isn't the right room. You are going to be worked, you are going to be challenged, but it's going to be fun. And also, don't wait for me to ask if you've got any questions. If there's anything that we're discussing, if there's anything that um, we'll be, you know, you're not sure about, feel free to raise your hand, shout out, ask the questions. Just so we're not moving on and skirting over a point which you require further clarification on. We all, we all okay with that? Good. And other than that, ensure that you have some kind of an objective for today. Very shortly, we're actually going to be getting your objectives for today and ensuring that we achieve them. But just start thinking about what it is that you want to get out from today. Why did you come here? What was your motivations to come to this session in the first place? Because the more focused you are on what it is that you want to get out of today, the more likely you are to achieve that. Okay. So we have a couple of um, really interesting gifts and bonuses for you. So at the end of the day, each of you are going to get one of these. Okay? They're, they're actually being whizzed over to us right now. And on this stick, you're going to have everything that we covered today. You're going to have six ebooks, okay, covering everything from goal setting, stress management, well-being, um, diet and nutrition, um, relaxation. There's a whole variety of different things there. And you're going to get free mind maps to help you to make sense of some of the things that we've talked about today. We're going to have some of the exercises that we're doing. We're going to do through the course of today as audio programs. There's going to be uh, a 10 minute holiday exercise, which won't mean much to you right now, but it will be, it will mean something to you by the end of the day. Um, and there's a variety of other tools and resources. So that's about 300 pounds worth of, of, of products and, and information uh, books there, which you will all get at the end of the day, just as your gift for attending today's session. So seeing as we're gonna be spending a bit of time together, would it be okay if I tell you a little bit about myself? Thank you. So as I said, I'm Neil Shaw. Today, I'm happy to say I'm happy, healthy, relaxed, I'm very successful. I run four different companies. I run the Stress Management Society. I run the Training and Development Company. Uh, we run an online shop and a corporate promotional products business. I have a wonderful team around me. I have some wonderful relationships. I'm in a really good place in my life. But it wasn't always that way. It was only about 10 years ago that I was essentially on the verge of a breakdown. I used to run a very successful HR and recruitment company. It was a multi-million pound company. I won several awards in that business, had breakfast with Tony Blair for business success. But I was quite young when I started that business and I made some poor decisions. And those poor decisions led to me actually having some challenges within that business, which eventually got me to a point where I was struggling. The business was going through a difficult time, which in turn was having a massive impact on my life. My relationships were suffering. I wasn't sleeping at night. I'd lost my appetite. I was losing weight. I was angry and frustrated. Just wasn't in a good place. I couldn't focus, couldn't support the staff around me. I'd lost my sex drive. And I was in a really low place. I was used to being on top of the world and I wasn't comfortable with the place I was in. And I wanted to break out of that cycle. So I sought help. I went to see life coaches, I read self-help books, I even went to see my doctor. I tried antidepressants at one point, nothing seemed to work. And eventually I got to the point where the stress and the challenge that I was going through was so great, it was having such an impact on my life and my health, that I had no choice but to get out of that situation. I 
basically shut that business down. I liquidated that business. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. I started that business from nothing. It was like a child that I'd grown to this, you know, very successful place, and I had to make the decision to shut it down. It was like having to shut the, the to turn the, the life support machine off. And I found myself sitting in a very low place, probably the lowest place I've ever been in my whole entire life. And I'm quite a literal person. I decided I need to get back on top of the world again. So I thought, I know what, I'll go to the highest place I can think of. The highest place I could think of was Mount Everest. So I went to the Himalayas with the intention of climbing Mount Everest. And it was that trip that really turned my life around. <coughs> William Blake said, strange things happen when men and mountains meet. The kind of things that don't happen when you're jostling in the street. There was never a truer word. Whilst I was in the Himalayas, whilst I was climbing Mount Everest, I spent every day focused on trying to stay alive. The fact that I'd lost my business, many of the people I called my friends, my car had been repossessed, I had no idea on how I was going to pay my bills when I got back. They paled into insignificance, because all I had to focus on was staying alive and getting to camp that evening. It really helped me to put my life into perspective. However, the pivotal moment within that experience was on the way back, we found a Buddhist monastery way up in the mountains, in the, probably the most isolated place you'd ever expect to find a monastery. And the monks invited us in, and we ended up staying a week with them. And I was fascinated at how they lived and approached their life. And they had their ancient tra traditions and their secret strategies on how to live a satisfying and fulfilling life. And even though we couldn't speak the same language and probably never exchanged a, a single word in the whole time I was there, I learned a hell of a lot from them. And not only did I learn some strategies which I found very useful for me, but I also found my focus. I had an epiphany moment. I made the decision that I wanted to help and support people that were going through the kind of challenges that I had experienced myself. And I returned and set up the Stress Management Society. Armed with the experience that I had whilst in the mountains, as well as some of the secrets I'd been introduced to, we came back and founded the society, and the rest really is history. And that's where I'm coming from. I'm not someone that's necessarily coming from a textbook perspective. A lot of my experience is on my own. I have got a number of professional qualifications. I'm a qualified clinical hypnotherapist, I'm a psychotherapist, I practice NLP and a variety of other things. But I would say, the bulk of the value that I can add to you is based on my own personal experience. And as we spend the day together, we'll obviously get to know each other a lot better and I'll share with you some more of my stories. But it's not just myself that will be here to support you today. I've got my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Andrea here. Um, she'll be running a session with you later today. She's the Communications Director at the Stress Mountain Society and she's also the author of the Stress Mum blog. And also at the back of the room, we have our angels. Um, if you could just wait. They're here solely to support you. You would have met them whilst you were registering. They're here to just to make sure that, that you have a fun and fulfilling day and you get what you need. So if you have any questions, if there's anything you need during the course of the day, make sure you come and have a chat with one of us and we'll be more than happy to help. So, before we start, as I said, this is your day. This is about you. So in order to ensure that you get what you need from today, we need to have an understanding of what that is. So what we're going to do, we're going to start the day by introducing ourselves, if that's okay. For some of you, this will probably be the most stressful part of the day, having to speak in front of a group of strangers. So let's get it out of the way first, and then we'll teach you how to deal with that stress. So what I'd like to know is who you are, and what, is, what it is that you want to get out of today. What was your motive or your objective for turning up today, or what is it that you want to take away at the end of the day? And what we'll do, we're going to get those written up on the flip chart, we'll stick them on the wall, and we'll sure, be sure that by the end of the day we've covered all those objectives. Okay, can we start this side of the room? Would that be right? <coughs> Perfect. Uh, my name's Kai. Hi Kai. And uh, I suppose I want to get out of more of a work-life balance. Work-life balance. To cope with work-life balance. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Kai. Hello. My name is Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn. And I'd like to probably get out more with organising lots of different projects. Okay. And selling. 
selling yourself. Yes, yeah, so well, presenting. Yeah. Good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Nina. I'm Nina. And uh, I two things for you. One is um, how to support others to manage stress. Okay. You know, it's quite simple. We were, you know, so I'm quite new in this. And um, how to identify my own stress because I'm not really a stressed person. I don't okay. recognise it sometimes. So. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jackie, and um, what I'd like to get out of today is to recognise early warning signs that I'm getting stressed, and also helping others with stress is part of my work, so I'm really interested to find out some information. Wonderful. What is it that you do? I um, manage a wellbeing programme. Excellent. Mental health Perfect. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to learn today is when I feel stressed, how do I push those thoughts away? Okay. Perfect. So how do you how do I control stress? Okay. Yeah. I suppose. Okay, so coping strategies so Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Louise. Um, I booked this back in November and um, at the time I thought it looked a really good programme, but I'm not too sure what I want to get out today, so I'm open. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name's Catherine and I booked them last night. <laughs> 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 I saw your booking. <laughs> um, and I've got a stressful situation with my neighbours, which I can't really control, so I either move or I stay. And, uh, and I want to learn how to manage my, my personal space and Hi. help others. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Abby and I want to learn how to minimise the stress I've got. Um, my work can be quite stressful. Okay. Um, I support people with mental health within the community. Okay. So that causes a bit of stress. Okay. Good. So minimising stress. Hello, my name is Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, and I want to learn about how to manage stress, the early warning signs of stress, and um, to understand stress. Okay. Good. Thank you. So understand stress. Hi. Hello. Hi. My name is Chris, and um, similar to the people, I want to sort of pinpoint the early warning signs. And also just to have more of a work life balance, something more stripped of work at the moment. Okay, good, thank you. Hi, Hi. I'm Rupert, um, and I'd like to know how to balance all the demands on my time a bit better. Perfect. Okay. Which may mean saying no to something, but I mm. have a way to balance all the things I'd like to do. Great. Hi. Um, I'm Rebecca, <coughs> I'd like to learn how to manage the effects of stress and also some tips to pass on to young people that I work with. Wonderful. Great. I'm Cherubin. I've got no particular position as I was invited by my friend. I was told to turn up here at 9 30. I've got an open mind. Open mind, great, thank you. Hi. I'm uh, fine, fine because my friend has a birthday treat for her. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> we'll sing you happy birthday before the end of the day. Um, I'm Apart from having Sherilyn here, I think it was an opportunity to really look at um, the whole area of stress. Correct. Thank you. Hi. Hi, hello, I'm Linda. Um, I would be up here to help everyone get the best out of the day. I'm also here for my personal reasons for being here um, as I spend a lot of my time um, through the work that I do working with people to help them reduce their stress, but I don't tend to help myself very much. So I'm just a bit of sort of this about me as well. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Georgina. I'm here to support you today as well. And also to get sort of different types of stress and um medium uh, not different different levels of stress. So I'm not Great. Thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Bernadette. I'm here to help you today. And I also want to know about stress and how to help people help less stress. I think we miss Dominique there at the back. Hi, I'm Dominique. Um, I'm a GP and uh, connected to stress all day, all week, all year. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I believe I can um, learn a few tricks from um, somebody who has some of the few secrets. Great, thank you. I'm Ange. Um, and <laughs> you just take a few things. For myself and also um, pass on the tips and 
is stress and anxiety. Okay. So I've suffered profoundly from anxiety in the past, but not seen as stress. And that stopped me doing a lot of things. Mm. So Wonderful. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. Thank you. Hi, my name's Adam. Uh, I'm here actually just to realise how to actually function with stress. <coughs> and okay. also to actually use it to, to help others. It is some of the stress hustling ideas. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Lynn. I came with my sister today. Um, but actually, my husband says that I do get stressed, but I don't feel that I get stressed. Mm -hmm. I think I might get more out of this than I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll see. Okay, right. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sue, and I'm here to learn some new techniques to pass on both what to use both for myself and for my patient. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my name's Julie Henderson. Um, I've come here with a group, uh, they invited me, and uh, um, I'm, I want to learn how you manage stress and that sort of thing. Thank you. <coughs> um, hi. hi, my name is Maria Lopez. I came with the same group that Julie. And I I want to learn today basically how to recognize the early symptoms of stress and okay. don't be okay. panic about it. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Hi. Hi, hi, my name is Shauna. Um I flew in from Belfast this morning with my sister. Um and basically I would like to find out about um stop to stop absorbing other people's stress. I manage quite a bit of team work and I find that I wouldn't call myself a very stressed person, but when I'm in work and I'm constantly listening to people who are stressed, I find that I can absorb their stress. And also home life, I have two quite young children and I'm quite keen to make sure that they don't become stressed people, so it's trying to manage that as well and teach them tips and tricks to deal with it. Wonderful. And you guys have flown in from Belfast for today's course? Yes. Okay, we'll have to organise a prize for being... Has <laughs> anyone yeah. come in from further than Belfast today? Oh, we went oh. the prize. Round the applause. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Corinna Todd. Um, so I've come here today just to learn a lot more about stress. Um, in my part, I have a very busy life. Um, three very young children and working full time, so sometimes you just feel like you're being pulled in all directions. So it's nice as well for us to take a day out today, just to be without children and enjoy our day. Um, I also did some work um, in colour breathing relaxation therapy about four years ago, so I'd like to also sort of build on that to try to develop that. Excellent. Hi. Hi, my name's Sophie. Um, now I know I get stressed and I think what I want to do is to learn how to um, respond to stress without pedalling faster and, pe and speeding up in response in the belief that that makes you more effective. Um, I'd like to find another sort of strategy or to be convinced that you don't have to respond like that. Um, and also to learn to how to sort of cope with technology. Mm. Um, you know, like with email, I sort of seem to end up with about three emails and there's always that sense that if you're, if you're not checking them that you're missing out on something um, or, you know, you will sort of somehow, things will all collapse if, you, if you're not sort of on top. Although it's impossible because I probably get about 200 emails a day now, so. I can relate to that. We probably get about four or five hundred a day, um, and it's yeah. It's how do you cope with that? Well, yeah. hopefully we'll recover some of that for you today. Okay. Now, what's really interesting is this is a two-part program. <coughs> so actually, all of you can go home at lunchtime because the whole afternoon is about your goals and achieving success. The morning is about stress, and the afternoon is about achieving your success. And interestingly, most of you are motivated to come here for the stress aspect. Well, hopefully, once we've got the stress out of the way, we can begin to focus on other areas. However, as I said, this is your session, this is your time, this is your day. If it means that we need to spend more time focusing on the things that are important to you, I'm happy to sort of uh, to, to, to focus on that a little bit further if need be. Okay? But as I said, we have got some interesting exercises this afternoon which are about goal setting and achieving your goals. You know, the first step is deal with the stress and then look at how you can build on that from there. The first question I have for you, and this is the first question that was asked of me when I was in the Himalayas, who is the most important person in your life? Okay. When I ask 
asked that question, can I have a show of hands? How many of you thought of someone else other than yourself? Be honest. Okay, about half the room. So your daughter, give me some other examples of the person you thought of when I asked that question. My kids. Your kids? Partner? Okay. Now this is interesting. Most people, when you ask them instinctively, the first response that will come to them is somebody else other than themselves. Pretty sure most of you have been on a plane at some point in your lives. If you're on a plane, before it takes off, and they go through the safety instructions and what you should do in case of emergencies, if there's a loss of cabin pressure and the oxygen mask come down, what should you do before putting an oxygen mask on somebody else? Put it on yourself. Would you all agree? What's the reason for that? Because you won't help. You can't save somebody else unless you save yourself. You can't save someone else if you haven't looked after yourself first. You're no good to anyone else if you're suffocating. For those of you that did think of your daughter, your husband, your mother, your father, your dog, your goldfish, when I said who's the most important person in your life, just be aware there's very little you can do for the people around you if you're crumbling yourself. If you're stressed, exhausted, ratty, ill, have no energy, how much can you do for your children? How much can you do for your partner? And prioritizing your own needs is not being selfish. <coughs> it's ensuring that you have an abundance of energy to support those around you, that you have the maximum resources available to do what you need to for your team, for your colleagues, for your friends, for your family. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'm not asking you to think about your own needs to be selfish, I'm asking you to think of your own needs so you can be selfless. So you can do more, be more and give more. So before we even get into the subject, I just want you to, 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 to set that intention, to prioritize your own needs first. Yeah? Are we all willing to do that? Good. And just try that for the course of today. As I said, we're, we're, we're approaching this scientifically. We're going to try everything for the, for, for the course of today and see how we get on. And then it's up to you if you decide to adopt that moving forward. Okay. So what is stress? You know, these days you can't turn on the television, pick up a newspaper or a magazine, turn on the radio without someone or the other going on about stress. <coughs> but what is stress? Perfect, yeah, great. What else? I don't see there is stress, I think there's pressure, and okay. it can have different spectrums, but I think sometimes there's the media catch on the stress. You are absolutely right, <coughs> thank you. And we'll come into that in more detail. What else, what else is stress to you? What is it to you? I think a sense of not being in control. Okay, yeah. Sense of not being in control? What else, what else happens to you? What do you sometimes think? I think Stress is like uh, anxiety or fear of a deadline. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What's your experience? What do you experience when you get stressed? Heart speed gets faster. Okay. Dizziness. Dizziness, yeah. Breathlessness. Breathlessness, yeah. <coughs> Tired. Tired, yes. Aggressive. Aggressive? <laughs> 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 Depends what you're doing, but yeah, you are right. I get eczema on my hands. Okay. It's really weird. <coughs> mm. Eat more. Eat more? Sleep What's that? Less. Okay, yeah, eat more and sleep less. I get skin rash. Sorry? I got skin rash. Skin you. rash? Now, interesting, most people, when you ask them about their experiences of stress, they can very easily relate to the feelings or the emotions of stress. You know, I feel out of control, I feel overwhelmed, I feel unhappy, sad, frustrated. And that's the first thing that we tend to catch on to. But interestingly, stress isn't a feeling or an emotion at all. The feelings or the emotions of stress are byproducts, but actually it starts as a physical response. Now the best way for me to, to illustrate that is to actually share with you a personal experience. Now a lot of people say to me, 
because of the work that I do. Neil, I bet you never get stressed. And it's kind of like saying to a doctor, I bet you never get ill. Or saying to a mechanic, I bet your car never breaks down. Of course the mechanic's car breaks down, of course the doctor gets ill. They just know what to do when it happens. And I describe myself in pretty much the same way. I get stressed just like everyone else, but I know how to recognize it and I know what to do when it happens. And I got stressed, oh, about three hours ago. So we were supposed to arrive here at a certain time and we made a plan to, 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 to leave at a particular time. And I was all ready to set off. And I always like leave a little bit of extra leeway, just in case there's any delays or traffic or whatever. And um, I was waiting for one of my colleagues to arrive this morning. And I was looking at our watch and we were kind of set the intention we were gonna set off about quarter past seven. And then, as it's starting to get later and later, I'm thinking this is cutting into our sort of margin of error and we might not get there in time and then what if we don't find parking immediately? And then all of a sudden I'm starting to notice that my heart's pounding in my chest. And as time starts ticking on now, it's like 20 minutes, 25 minutes later than we're supposed to leave, I'm noticing my breathing's come shallow and fast, my muscles are tensing up, starting to feel angry and hostile, we're always late and we're not gonna get ready in time and people are gonna turn up and everything's gonna go wrong. I'm starting to grip the steering wheel much tighter because I'm actually sitting in the car by myself at this point. My bladder's relaxed, all of a sudden I need to go to the toilet. I'm suddenly starting to feel a lot warmer. Now my car's telling me it's minus one outside, but I'm, you know, temperature hasn't changed, but I'm having to roll the window down because I'm starting to feel much warmer. My blood pressure's risen, my blood sugar's risen. Now, right, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But can anyone relate to those symptoms? Because actually that's where stress starts. There's substances like adrenaline and cortisol that are released into your bloodstream that change the way that your body's functioning. For what reason? What's the benefit of that? Fight or flight. What is fight or flight? Survival. Yeah, I was ready for action. So. Yeah. So, caveman Joe, strolling through the jungle on the plains of Africa when human beings first surfaced on planet Earth about 150,000 years ago, and he's strolling back to the cave to watch cave telly with a cave wife, and a saber toothed tiger jumps out in front of him. He would have exactly the same experience that I did sat in my car in my driveway earlier today. It's the same substances that are released into his body, the same physiological changes occur. How would it help Caveman Joe to go through those changes and to have that experience? What does it allow him to do? Live. Run. Sorry? Live. Live, yeah, because it's going to allow him to either leg it as fast as he can to escape from that saber tooth tiger, or to use all of his body's strength to overpower that tiger, maybe to rest him to the ground and save his skin, essentially. It's a survival mechanism that nature gave us for a very good reason. Hi. So it could be argued when somebody's stressed, they're stronger or faster. Definitely, 100% correct. And you know, let me, let me just be blunt with you. If human beings didn't have the stress response, we would have been extinct 100,000 years ago. It was stress that enabled us to survive as a species. It's a very good thing if used appropriately. That's where the challenge comes in. In modern life, we live very differently to Caveman Joe. We have cars and mobile phones and computers and houses, <coughs> and we work in offices. <coughs> we have evolved the way that we live our lives drastically. However, under the skin, under the bonnet, it's the same engine that's been running for 150,000 years. When nature designed us, it never expected us to be living in this way. It never expected us to be approaching the lo our lives in the way that we do in the 21st century. It didn't expect Facebook and Twitter. Nature didn't anticipate that. That's human design. That's where the challenge comes in. The better we get to understand ourselves and the way that nature designed us, the better equipped we are to protect ourselves from whatever challenges modern life throws at us. And that's where our journey starts today. By understanding that primal, instinctive stress response that nature gave humanity 150,000 years ago. So, we've got an idea of you know, what happens to us when we get stressed physically. Those feelings, or those emotions of stress, I just want to be clear, those feelings or emotions are byproducts. 
What kind of feelings do you have when you're stressed? We mentioned a few already. What kind of things do you feel when you're stressed? Panic. Panic? I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this? Overwhelmed, yeah, overwhelmed, out of control, can't deal with this, yeah? What else? <coughs> Anger, yeah. A lot of those feelings are directly as a result of the, the, the changes that have occurred in your body. What parts of your body do you think are important for you to, to be using effectively when you're under attack by a saber tooth tiger? Legs. Yeah? Arms and legs. Yes. So you used to defend an attack, right? <coughs> your head, interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that. I've got direct experience of that. I'll come back to it in a minute. So you don't actually need your brain to be functioning effectively. So oxygenated blood doesn't flow to your brain, hence we start to have all these feelings. I'm going to go into that in more detail. But I just want to be clear, those feelings or emotions are directly connected to physical changes. If you change what's going on in your body, in turn it changes how you feel. So, your body has come under attack. It puts itself in its, in its best possible state to allow you to survive that battle. Now, I'm really into science fiction, and the best way for me to describe this to you is to draw an analogy from science fiction. Now, for those of you that don't like science fiction, I apologize in advance, but it's a way that makes sense to me, and hopefully you'll, you'll get this. So as I said, you know, I love watching Star Wars and Star Trek and that kind of thing, and I'd just like you to imagine Star Trek, Starship Enterprise from Star Trek. Captain Kirk at the helm, there's a very good reason for that. Flying through space, and they get attacked by some hostile aliens. What two systems on his spaceship are most essential for him to survive that battle? Um, yeah. Shields. Shields. Shields, yeah? And what else? His team. His team? Actually, you know, there are some episodes of Star Trek where he's the only one left on the ship and he's still doing battle. Boy, no, we have a Trekkie, thank you. <laughs> There's always one. Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. So he needs his shields and his weapons. Would you agree? He could actually afford to shut down various non-essential systems on his ship to allow him to survive that battle. He could shut down the engines and draw power from the engines to use for shields and weapons. He could shut down the holodecks and the transporters. He could shut down the mess hall, he could shut down a variety of systems, even life support, a system that's essential to keep people alive, could temporarily be shut down if it's for the greater good of the whole ship surviving that battle. Would you agree? For a temporary period of time, he could do that without having too much of a negative impact to the functioning of his ship. Now, the human body works in exactly the same way. As we've established, if you come under attack, would you all agree you'd be using your arms and your legs to kick, punch, defend yourself with, right? <laughs> that is true for most people that, that I ask that question of. I run my sessions around the world, and there is one city where actually everyone unanimously said something different. That was Glasgow. <laughs> now I ask them the question, if you were under attack, what part of your body would you use to defend yourself? Definitely. And they all said simultaneously, me head. <laughs> I didn't know that up until, uh, I didn't know up until that time that it's known as a Glasgow kiss. So for, it's true for most people, it would be your hands and feet that you'd be using to defend yourself with. So your body actually prioritises our resources and sends oxygenated blood and the resources to the muscles responsible to allow you to defend and attack yourself with. When those substances like adrenaline and cortisol are released into your body, it changes the way it's functioning to allow you to, to run as fast as you possibly can or use all of your body strength to overpower that saber two tiger or whatever it is that's attacking you. So if that was the case, what are the non-essential systems or functions of your body that you could shut down temporarily? Sorry? The brain. The brain. Now, if you are under attack by a saber tooth tiger, what kind of decisions do you need to make? Flee. Do I run? Do I fight? I'm yeah. going to jump under that bush. I'm going to climb that tree. Would you all agree they're relatively simple, black and white, instinctive decisions? Yeah, you all agree with that? 
There's a part of your brain that's responsible for that. It's called the medulla. It's kind of here at the back of your head, at the top of the, the, the spine. Some people call it the reptilian brain or the primitive brain. And its job is to keep you alive, pure and simple. It has no other function than to keep you alive. It's responsible for those instinctive, black and white, I have to react, I have to do something really quickly. Its job is not lateral thinking, or problem solving, or creative thinking, or all of the resources that we actually need to get through modern life. Those, are, uh, those functions take place in other parts of the brain which actually shut down or diminish in their capacity when you get stressed. Again, by design, there's a good reason for that. Let's think about why. Saber Two Tiger in front of Caveman Joe is about to attack, and Caveman Joe's thinking, well, if I jump onto that branch and then I use uh, the momentum to swing onto, onto the top of that bush, and from that bush I can bounce over onto that ledge, and then I can run away. If he starts planning that kind of a complex escape, from this situation, what's likely to happen? It's too late. Whilst he's planning his escape, the tiger's chewing his leg off. Do you see why nature actually shuts down those capacities? Because actually, it prevents you from acting quickly. May not necessarily be the best action to take, but you will do something to remove yourself from that situation. Now, for Game Man Joe, that was great. If you're sat at your desk with a work deadline, or you've got to get an email out, or you've got to get a report out, or you're you know, um, at home and the kids are screaming and you know, the washing needs to be done and the tea needs to be made, is getting into that state helping you? Is it allowing you to think of a creative solution to the challenges that you're facing? No, no but it's hard to give it up because, in a sense, it sort of motivates you. There's a perception. It's obviously in the wrong way, but it's like, it's that fear that if you don't respond like that, then you won't complete what you're supposed to complete, and it's really hard to give it up. <laughs> it's it's a <laughs> wonderful it's thing, a but. wonderful point that you've raised <laughs> because you're absolutely correct. We have the perception that we're better equipped to deal with the tasks that we're facing, but actually. What kind of decisions do you make when you're stressed? When you're in a state of stress, when you're really stressed out about something, what kind of decisions do you make? Good ones? Can you all relate to that? You, it's normally quite rash, instinctive. You'll react. And then when you're reflecting back on that, you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done it like that. Maybe I could have done it this way. You're absolutely correct. For many of us, that's exactly what happens. That if I had, if I sat here and think, oh my god, it's already ten to eleven, and I've got all this to get through before the break, and if I don't do all this, then it's going to put the whole day out of sync, and then the whole day is going to be terrible, and they're going to get to the end of the day, and they're going to be walking out and be like, oh my god, that workshop was terrible. It's such a bad experience, and they're going to be walking back, and then they're going to go for a drink, and some bloke in the pub is going to say, you should phone up Watchdog, and then tomorrow you're going to phone up Watchdog, and then Monday morning, Watchdog is going to turn my house with video cameras, and then the front page of the news of the world is the worst person on the whole planet. If I start thinking to myself in that way. How does that impact my performance? <laughs> How does that help me to do what I need to do in the next half an hour? Doesn't. How many of you have ever thought that way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> do you see where I'm coming from? We put ourselves in a low resource state. We start to panic, we start to feel anxious, we start to get stressed, which in turn actually diminishes our capacity to do what we set out to do in the first place. Because actually, when you are a little bit more relaxed and a little bit calmer, you can think more clearly, you can make better decisions, you can think creatively and problem solve and think laterally and find better solutions to the challenges that you're facing. Now, once again, as I said, you know, I want to give you a bit, a, a bit more of an insight in, in, into why I do what I do. I care about the planet. I care about the environment. I care about what we do, you know, how many animals are going extinct every day that there are only 3,200 tigers left on the planet and that kind of thing. That's something that's very important to me. 
If we are walking around in a state of survival, who are you concerned with? Whose issues and needs are you concerned with? Yourself. It's very difficult to be concerned with the environment or the state of the economy or what's going on in your communities when all we are concerned with is our own immediate needs and survival. Sadly, that's what stress does. It puts us into a state of survival. And essentially, we become slaves to that. My theory, my opinion is that there are more slaves on planet Earth today than at any other point in history. In the past, you know, when people were taken from, from Africa to the Americas, they knew they were slaves. They were shackled and they were put on boats and shipped to different parts of the world. Most people today don't even know they're slaves. But they've been put into a state of fear and stress, which means the only thing they can focus on is immediate survival and not actually be concerned about any issues beyond that. The way I see it is if we can get beyond that stage, then we can start caring about things beyond our own immediate needs of survival. That's what I stand for, and that's hopefully what I'm here to support you with today. So once you get beyond your own needs of survival, then you can obviously think about what you can do to support and care for others around you. Okay, well, when you say thinking about things, in what way, in what sense? What kind of things are you thinking about? What, what, what thought patterns are you experiencing? Well, those sort of panic thoughts that I'm talking about, where okay. it's that kind of rather than doing stuff. That's, when you go into that kind of panic state, because there's less oxygen going to the parts of your brain responsible for clear thinking and, and, and thought, that's the end result. I will be showing you on how to break that cycle, if that helps. Um, but that's, you know, it's quite normal. It happens to a lot of us. Because you've got that little voice in your head, you know, a little voice that's telling you you're not good enough, or you can't do it, or it's too much, or I'm too stressed, or I don't have enough time, or don't have enough money, or I'm not good looking enough, or I'm too old, or too young, or whatever. You know, and it's job is survival, it's job is to protect you. So it tells you those things to prevent you from doing something that could lead to harm or injury or upset. Does that make sense? So. It, it, that little voice thinks it's helping you, but actually it's working against you. And in the past, you know, Caveman Joe's days, that voice would have been good because it would have prevented him going into the, the, the jungle or whatever, into a situation that could have hurt, led to harm. Modern life is a little bit different. So what else? What other functions of the body could we shut down? We've established the brain. Um, the digestive. Mm -hmm. The digestive system. If you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, do you need your digestion to be functioning effectively? No. no. It's not going to help you in any way, so you can shut it down. Now, first, let's put this into perspective. If you were being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, how long is that situation going to last at most? Well, you have to get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in ter terms of time, let's put a time frame on it. How long is it going to last? Seconds. Seconds. Seconds to minutes. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So once again, nature and its infinite wisdom, when it gave us the response of stress, it would never anticipated that we'd be in this state for more than a few minutes at a time. Just long enough to deal with whatever was causing the stress, and then you get out of that state and relax. You were never designed to live in a state of stress. That was never how nature expected us to be using this response. We weren't designed to be walking around in this state 24-7. That's another one of the big challenges. So you could shut digestion down for a few minutes, would you agree, without any adverse challenge? But when you stay in that state for hours, days, sometimes longer, that can cause a challenge. What happens if you continue to eat and your digestion is not working effectively? Diarrhea. Um, Diarrhea, constipation, tummy upsets, irritable bowel syndrome, which is a nervous condition directly connected to stress. Now, you know, you can get medication to treat the symptoms, but that won't address the cause. And also, what happens to your food choices when you get stressed? What are you reaching for? Gratification food. It's not celery, and, uh, celery or apples, is it? <laughs> so this is interesting. Your food choices change, and your body's ability to process that food diminishes, which also results in a larger amount of that, that food being stored as fat. 
And actually, the, the substances like cortisol inhibits your ability to uh, digest that fat. So I'll let you in on another secret. Stress people gain weight. Well, they can lose weight because they can lose their appetite. That's what happened to me. I just stopped eating and I lost weight. But equally, if, you're, if you are continuing to eat, stress people are likely to gain weight. So you can have a very healthy diet and you could be exercising. But if you have high levels of stress, you'll find that, that, that that's going to have an impact on your ability to lose weight. So digestion, higher brain function. What else? What else could you shut down temporarily? You find that your heat up because your heart's pumping harder and you're yeah, breathing faster. Um, your, your like yeah. Like what will happen is the blood will pull into, uh, it will move away from your skin and it will be pulled internally, so your outer extremities will cool down, definitely. And you'll see that each of you in your packs will have a little stress card. The colder your hands are, the more stressed you are. And as you relax and warm up, uh, the, the blood will start flowing to the skin again and they'll warm up, which is how those little stress cards work. Okay, what else? Reproductive system. If you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, do you need your sex drive or your libido to be functioning effectively? <laughs> Depends how attractive you find that saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> but, <laughs> but would you agree that for most of us, if you know, sex is the last thing on your mind when you're extremely stressed out? You know, let's just imagine you had a really, really stressful day at work. You know, we're on a scale of 1 to 10, we're talking about a 15. You get in the car to drive home or on the train and there are delays and there's traffic and your half an hour journey takes two and a half hours. You get home, you walk into the house, are you then thinking about grabbing your partner and jumping in the sack? Is that the first thing on your mind? If you did, it would be a great release, but for most of us, it's the last thing on your mind. Now, again, from a biological perspective, let's understand why that, that happens. Your blood... Your oxygenated blood is being diverted to the muscles responsible for defense and attack. Those muscles involved in reproduction aren't really useful for defense and attack. So blood flow diminishes to those areas. Now, I read an article in a newspaper. I'm not sure of the validity of the research. I'm not going to make any claims on that. But the, this article suggested that one of the, uh, the, the more common reasons for a man over the age of 50 to visit their, their doctor is erectile dysfunction. Okay. Again, I'm not claiming to, 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 to back that research or anything like that, but I'm just using this as an example. If you go to the doctor and you have erectile dysfunction, what's he likely to give you? Now, this is talking about the size of the solution, not the size of the problem, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what's he likely to give you? Viagra. Yeah, a little blue pill, a Viagra, which addresses the symptoms. But that, does that address why you have that problem in the first place? No. Huh. Interestingly, when you take the time to relax, and manage your stress, your body starts to function effectively and, and, and in its normal state, and blood starts flowing to the genital regions and, and, and to the reproductive organs. Now, obviously, women get impacted in the same way. It's just a lot more noticeable when it happens to a man. In women, it can lead to impact on your menstrual cycles. It can lead to infertility issues in men and women. It can lead to, to menstrual issues. And that's because, as I said, like, these are non-essential systems for immediate survival. You don't need to reproduce to survive. And your body will essentially shut that function down temporarily. Five, ten minutes, not a problem. Days, weeks, problem. And then do you see how work-related stress can then start having an impact on your personal lives and your relationships? Okay, so reproduction is another system. What else? What else could you shut down temporarily? What other functions of the body? What about pain? Is pain going to serve you if you're being attacked by a saber tooth tiger? No. At the moment, I'm running a project with the Ministry of Defence on soldiers that suffer from post traumatic stress syndrome, you know, that have been to Afghanistan or to the Gulf and have had extreme challenges um, and has had a, a mental and emotional impact on them. So, we've been running programmes of coaching and training with them. And there was one individual I was working with a couple of months ago. And he'd been in Afghanistan, out on patrol with his colleagues, and they'd been doing this patrol pretty much every day for a couple of weeks. 
um, and nothing had happened. They, you know, they got to know the locals, and everything was, was you know, they were, it was quite a friendly environment. So there was no challenges, and they'd never been under attack. And one particular day, they were out, and there was no one around. And well, this is unusual. There's normally like you know kids playing or farmers out, or people around. There was no one around. Um, and essentially they got ambushed, so I'll cut a long story short, they got ambushed and they were in a firefight situation, they got bagged into a compound and they were being shot at. And that situation lasted for about sort of 20 minutes, they'd radioed for, for a backup and assistance but it took some time for support to arrive. So about sort of 25 minutes, half an hour later, support arrived and they were evacuated, they were put into these troop carriers and this particular soldier that I was talking to said it was at that point that, um, that one of the, the commanding officers made him aware that his shirt sleeve was red. And as they st stripped it back, they realised he'd been shot in his arm twice. So we're not talking about a paper cut here, we're talking about two AK-47 rounds in his upper arm. Yet up until that point, he hadn't registered the pain. He, hadn't, he wasn't even aware that he'd been shot. As soon as they cut his top off and he was aware of his shot, first thing he started <laughs> screaming, it became hysterical. And then he actually went catatonic, and for 24 hours he was unable of, uh, incapable of communicating with anyone. So he was literally just frozen and shut down. Now, this is interesting, because as soon as he became aware, he reacted hysterically, and he had a very exaggerated response. Well, not exaggerated, I think it was appropriate. Mm. If I'd been shot, I would have reacted in probably a worse way. But why is it that he didn't react and register that pain, uh, or even... He wasn't even aware that he'd been shot at the time when he was involved in that firefight. Because the thing was okay. Yeah? Mm. What would have happened if he had registered the pain? He, he would have panicked and he'd be dead. It. Sorry? He would have reacted to it. He would have reacted to it, and then what could have happened? Got he could have got killed, or what else could have happened? Lost concentration. Yeah. Spent. Which could have done what? Not influence how the rest of his team yeah. came out of the situation. So it, not only could it have cost him his life, but it could have cost the lives of his colleagues. Would you all agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's like kept fighting on, he's, he's kept on shooting and doing whatever he needed to do to get himself out of that situation. <laughs> it's only when the situation was finished did he suddenly become aware of the pain. So his body, again <laughs> by design, had shut the pain off to allow him to survive that situation. It's, would you agree it's a useful thing to shut the pain off yeah. in a, that, a situation like that? But would you all agree that pain is a good thing? Yeah. You all understand why pain is a good thing, right? What's it telling you? It <laughs> tells you there's something wrong and they need to take action to deal with it. You all agree? Yeah. Now you might think to yourselves, I'm not a soldier. I don't work in a battlefield. How does this affect me? Let me explain. How many of you here work at a desk? Okay, majority of you. And for those of you that don't work at a desk, you may be able to relate to what I'm talking about. You spend your day, you know, tapping around the keyboard or doing whatever you do for work. Maybe you're a teacher and you've been in the classroom, or you're a doctor or a nurse and you, you know, you've been in the wards, and you've been working very, very hard the whole day. And you've not really had time to take a break, it's been really busy, you've been whizzing through the whole day, getting through your, your projects and your deadlines, and you get to the end of the day and you get up to go home. And as you get up to go home, it's oh my god, my back's killing me. Oh my shoulders are so sore. Damn, I've got such a bad headache. Can I relate to those kind of feelings? That at the end of the day you suddenly realise how knackered and exhausted and how much pain and tension you have in your body. Yeah, can you relate to that? You're no different to the soldier. You did exactly what the soldier did. However, for the soldier, it was useful. For yourselves, the moment that you started to experience that tension or that headache started to come on, you weren't aware of it because you'd shut the pain off, so you weren't able to react and do, to do something about it. You know, how often do we spend, spend the whole day staring at that computer screen, tapping away on the keyboard, shoulders hunched up, eyes straining, and again, because we've, we've shut the pain response down or diminished it, we're not aware of the impact it's having until it's too late. If you'd caught the pain a little bit earlier or the tension building up earlier, you may have been able to get up and stretch or do something to prevent it from becoming the bigger issue that it tends to become. How long do you think the human body was designed to sit stationary statically? 
in a go. This is according to the British Chiropractic Society. How long do you think the human body was designed to sit, sit statically? 20 minutes. Absolutely correct. Really good guess. Yeah. Did you know that? <laughs> You're absolutely correct. 20 minutes. The human body was designed to sit for only periods of about 20 minutes at a time. Because if you think about it, Cain Man Joe, did he spend his time sitting around on a chair? No, he was out hunting for food or gathering berries or, or whatever, or chasing his children around the cave. He never sat there. He didn't even have a bloody armchair. He had a rock to sit on. <laughs> so we've been sitting for more than 20 minutes. We need to get up and stretch. <laughs> we need to get up. <laughs> this is an interactive participative session, so so you just have to stretch up. Ugh, nice little moan. Stretch over to one side. Ugh. And the other. Ugh. And back. And forward. Alright, grab a seat. I'll be doing that periodically just to be sure that you don't go away with tension in your back at the end of the day. Um, and if I fail to, 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 uh, to, to stretch you and you, know, you feel like you need a stretch, feel free to get up and get a run up with you as well. Now, that's how long we were designed to sit. What about in terms of focus? How long do you think the human mind has the capacity to focus on one task before it starts to lose focus, before it, its ability to concentrate starts to diminish? 45 minutes, okay. Anyone else? 20 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? <laughs> 7 hours. I just guess. You know, there is a, a standard. For me, it's about 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I've got, you know, the attention span of a goldfish. You can be distracted very easily. They say it's a sign of genius. <laughs> so to myself that. Who says that? <laughs> I mean, that's why I commit to myself. But uh, again, according to research, they suggest that it's about an hour and a half. It's, it's about the full extent of our ability to focus. So you can focus on, on an activity for about an hour and a half, and then beyond that you start to lose focus. And Andrew's going to talk more about that later, but your, your results will start to diminish. Now what's really interesting is most of us spend seven or eight hours a day at work. And we may have a bit of lunch, but we don't really work in one and a half hour blocks, do we? Does anyone here work in one and a half hour blocks? Okay, a couple of you, great. Now, the, the research behind that was actually very valid. And there's one of our clients that we're working with, and it wasn't based on our, our advice. Um, it's the, the Corporation of London. So essentially, they're the local authority for the, the square mile, uh, of the, the financial district of London. And they were so fascinated by this research, and they really wanted to, 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 to ensure that they were supporting their staff because they, their, their stress levels were quite high. They actually implemented a computer system that once every hour and a half, your system will shut down. The staff are looking to revolt at the moment and throw their computers out the window because it's the most frustrating thing. Now, the intention behind it was good. Their methods were flawed. I don't think we should be imposing it on people. But it's for you to take it on board that if my brain can only focus for an hour and a half, just taking a short break will allow you to refocus and will actually massively increase your productivity. Once again, Andrew's going to talk about that in more detail this afternoon. And we do do things to take a break, but it's just ensuring that you are not stretching yourself beyond your ability to focus. So, you know, try and operate in hour and a half blocks and you'll find that your results will massively increase. Okay. And what else? There's a couple more things. Well, one more thing in particular, actually, that I think we should be aware of. What, what is that last function of the body? There are plenty of others, but, but this is one that you'd be aware of. The last function of the body that you could afford to shut down temporarily. Well, your breathing would change, but it wouldn't shut down. But your immune system, if you're being attacked by a saber tooth tiger, do you need your immune system to be functioning effectively? No. <laughs> yeah, or a few weeks or a few days. It doesn't impact immediate survival. So you could actually afford to shut your immune system down. Has anyone ever found that after periods of stress, you get ill? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. But you don't get ill when, you, when you, the adrenaline's going. Mm -hmm. 
As a teacher, you always get ill in half terms of holidays. There are reasons for that. Mm. I'll talk about that in a second. But before we come to that, what's the time of year when we're most likely to get ill? What time of year are people most likely to catch Winter. cold or flu? Winter. Winter. Well, we have a GP at the back. When are people most likely to come and see you with a cold or flu, Dominique? <laughs> November to January. Now, according to some research done by HR professionals, in November to January is kind of that, that, that period of flu season. The peak two weeks when people are most likely to have a cold or a flu is the first couple of weeks in January. Yeah? So that's when people are most likely to, to, to put in a sick note and not be able to go to work. What's the reason for that? Why is it that we are more likely to get ill in the first two weeks in January than other times of year? Because bear in mind, I used to think that the flu bugs come out of hibernation in January and strike us down as we're going back to work. But interesting, I've learned recently that there's just as much flu around in August and July as there is in January. It's not like there's more bugs and bacteria around, we just seem to be more susceptible. Why are we more susceptible in January? Or, you know, November to January, but particularly in the first couple of weeks in January? It's it's yeah. Now, I've still got this image in my head of Christmas being this wonderful, magical time of year. I still believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> he still brings me presents, so, you know, someone's putting them there. But for a lot of people, the reality is Christmas is a very stressful time of year. Yeah, it's dreadful. Financially stressful, it's the pressures of getting it right, you know, interpersonal conflicts, you're throwing to close proximity with family, there's, you know, there's a variety of different pressures around Christmas. And then on top of that, the physical stresses that we're eating more than we usually do, drinking more alcohol than we do, more time indoors, more time sit, sitting on the sofa watching reruns of The Great Escape and not getting fresh air and ex exercise and activity. So your immune system is taking a hit. And we go back to work in January, and you go back into a working environment where you know there are germs and bugs and bacteria. In fact, I've written research that on the tube, if you travel on the tube, you'll be exposed to up to 3,000 different bugs and bacteria on a daily basis, including hepatitis, tuberculosis, and all kinds of nasty things. Why is it you don't come down with these illnesses? Because your immune system is able to cope with them. <coughs> However, when we weaken our immune systems by the way that we're living our lives, it leaves us more susceptible to illness. So stressed people are more likely to get ill. Now, there was this phenomenon, which you know, some of you have correctly identified, where people were going on holiday, and the first or second day on holiday, they'd get sick. This is curious. One of the other hats that I wear is I was for several years uh, British Airways Global Spokesperson for Wellbeing. So for, if you ever travel on British Airways, all the wellbeing stuff they have in the magazines and on their website and on their in-flight audios, that was stuff that I created. So we used to work very closely with British Airways identifying how their passengers experience stress and how we can support the passengers and having the, the most relaxing, calm experience whilst they travel. And what we were finding is the reason that people get stressed when they go on holiday is what is the week or two weeks before you go on holiday usually like? You manic. get your work finished, don't you? Yeah, so you're manically trying to get through all your workload and get everything up to date and deal with all your emails and all the meetings and get everything done. And then on top of that, you're busy at work and you get home in the evenings, you've got, you've got to buy stuff for your holiday, you've got to pack, you've got to prepare things. If you've got kids, then that, 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 that's multiplied by how many people that you've got to look after. And then you've got to get all that stuff and get in the car and get to the airport and you know, you might find that, especially if you're traveling one of the cheaper airlines, the airport's in the middle of nowhere, like Stansted or wherever, and you get to the airport and then you've got long queues to, to, to check in and then eventually you check in and then you've got security to deal with and they, you know, I, I went to New York over Christmas and literally they pretty much strip searched me, it was just horrendous, I'd empty my bag and everything, so you get through that and you get onto the plane and then you're sitting with your knees up your nose for like seven or eight hours depending on where you're going, very uncomfortable and also the plane is actually a very unhealthy environment, what's the reason for that? It yeah. If, if there is one person on that plane that has a cold or a flu, if you're on that plane, I think if, if it's like a Boeing 747, if you're on that plane for more than four hours, eventually you're going to be breathing that person's air because it's recycling. And eventually, you know, if, the, if you're on that plane for more than four hours and there's a couple hundred people, eventually you're going to breathe everyone's germs in. Okay. Cut your in the window. Yeah. <laughs> you could try that one. So this is interesting. <laughs> That you have an immune system that has been weakened by a period of extended stress in the preparation to get on holiday, then you've got that kind of last hurdle of stress 
through the airport experience, and then you're put into an environment where your immune system is really low and weak, and then you're put into a very unhealthy environment where your, immune, your weakened immune system is much more susceptible to any bugs and bacteria that are around. <coughs> Which is why then you get on holiday and you know, that, 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 that kind of stews and, and, and marinates in your body and a couple of days later you come down with a cold or a flu. Now this is interesting. Because according to studies, a, a lot of illnesses could be caused by stress. Heart disease is one. The British Heart Foundation have recently revised their advice. Up until recently, they would have suggested one of the, uh, I think it was up until about two or three years ago, they would have suggested that one of the most common reasons for people to have heart attack or heart disease is what? Fat. Sorry? Fat or diet, right? You have a poor diet, you eat crap food, it's going to lead to heart disease. Well, actually, they revised that. That, yes, a poor diet can cause heart disease. But actually, one of the things that is a primary contributing factor to heart disease is stress. So essentially, you can have a really bad diet. You could eat you know, junk food and have a pretty poor diet, and you may avoid heart disease. I'm not saying you won't, you may. It's a lottery. If you have high levels of stress, eventually it's going to cause heart disease. You are much more likely to cause heart disease through stress. And then if you have a poor diet as well, which we know that stress leads to poor food choices, that coupled together can lead, obviously, to, to massively increasing your chance of having heart disease. What, what is high levels of stress? Is it suffer, every day, <coughs> suffering with stress on a daily basis, ongoing? Or, you know, when you, when you, when you mention high levels of stress, what but do you mean? That's a really good point. I thank you for raising that. Because getting stress isn't a problem. That's one of the things I'm going to talk about now. Getting stress isn't a problem if you deal with it. It's getting stressed and staying stressed and not doing anything about it is where the problem comes in. So if you get stressed every day, but you do something to counter every day, you right. balance it. So what, what do you do? To that's why you're here. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll get to that. Right. Yeah, we'll, I'm going to show you obviously what you can do. But that's that's the point I'm making. A lot of us get stressed and we don't take action, so we stay stressed. That's when it begins to have a damaging impact to our bodies. Okay. So getting stressed isn't necessarily a problem. It's when we don't do anything with that state. So, the immune system is the other. So you've gone into this state, you've gone into a state of stress, and obviously your body's expecting, it's anticipating something to happen, and that's where obviously we can take some action. So we'll be coming onto that a little bit more uh, later in the day. But the next thing really from our perspective is to understand what stress means. <coughs> what is stress? If we as a group get def uh, commissioned by the Oxford Dictionary to define stress, how could we define stress? What does it mean? Too much pressure. Too much pressure? Mm -hmm. So we're looking for a dictionary definition of stress. Survival, Survival yeah. What else? Threaten. Okay. So we're looking like, you know, if someone picks up a dictionary and they didn't know what stress meant, under stress, what would we put? Yeah, <coughs> feeling of being out of control? Not, not being in control. Okay. <laughs> Threaten? Physical, emotional, and that has an effect on your well being. Definitely. Inability to manage pressure. Great, thank you. Uh, believing you can't do something can actually become stress. Yeah. Now, what was interesting, we came into existence as an organisation about 10 years ago now, and there was a variety of different organisations that look at and deal with stress. If you go to the NHS, they've got one definition. If you go to the health and safety executive, they've got another. You know, various different agencies and bodies have different definitions of stress, and some are a little bit conflicting or contradictory, some just, you know, a, a, a poles apart. Now, if the experts don't have a common definition, that gives us a challenge as lay people to understand it. And we found that that, that was one of our biggest challenges, is to find a good common definition of stress that everyone could relate to. And the best definition of stress that I came across didn't come from a medical professional or an academic. It came from an engineer. Is anyone here from an engineering background? Excellent, great. How would an engineer describe stress? Like the class. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. 
I'm going to share with you what an engineer shared with me about 10 years ago. It was so good, it was such a good analogy, we actually adopted it as our own. So I'm going to sort of illustrate what this engineer had shared with me. Now, I'm going to apologise in advance for my artistic abilities. Tony Hart was one of my...